But my name is Phil Beavers. And uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the son of Gene Beavers, and his face was up on the wall uh, being um, one of the preachers and ministers here at the Algonac Church of Christ back in 19, uh, let's see if I can remember this, 1962 to 73 is when uh, my dad uh, preached here. Uh, at Algonac, and uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here at your 71st anniversary. Now, I'm not sure why I was invited to do this, um, but uh, there is some significance uh, for me to be here, and and uh, I want to share that with you here for a moment. Um, there's uh, th this particular weekend, and I'll, well, first of all, let me invite. Um, I invite my mom to wave. I brought mom, Gaylene. <laughs> She's over here. <laughs> yep. And um, the significance of uh, this weekend, first of all, Dad preached here for 11 years. And many of you um, might have been around when that happened. I see a lot of familiar faces and, and so on. Um, he and mom loved the church here. Uh, it was their second full-time um, ministry after graduating from Lincoln Bible Institute. And he loved the leadership of this church, and they were very supportive and generous uh, to my family. And I appreciate that. And, of course, um, I grew up here at Algonac. I graduated from Algonac High School. Go, go muskrats. Yeah, right. I should have worn my... I should have wore my varsity sweater. Right. Now, it would have come up to here <laughs> like that with a big A on it, you know, but um, now, I, you know, it's a good thing I didn't. Yeah. That, that wouldn't have looked too well. But, uh, but grew up here, have a lot of memories here. Um, I, I think about, and I mentioned this about a year ago when I preached. Um, about how this is where I gave my life to Christ. This is where I gave my life to Jesus. And of course, I credit a lot of that to my parents. And I credit a lot of that to the Sunday school teachers and the youth group leaders here at Algonac. And it was on uh, June the 8th, 1965, when I was nine years old, I came up and dad was standing right over there. and. He took my hand and took my confession of faith, and then I was baptized right here. And um, so a lot of good memories. That, that's kind of the highlight. I mean, there were some lows, let me tell you. There were some lows where I was doing some things I probably shouldn't have been doing as a preacher's kid, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, and uh, I repented for it, and I'm good now, okay? I, I'm good now. Um, but again, you know, my parents just love this, this church. And uh, ha having you celebrate 71 years just really highlights the faithfulness of this congregation. Now, you know, it, it takes a lot of people to encourage and to bring a church to where it's at. And you've got great leadership that has brought great preachers that have brought you to where you're at today. And uh, I, think, uh, I think about Dad and um, the significance of, the, of this weekend, I want to tell you, and I, I don't want any pity or anything like that. I just think it's really, really significant. Um, the significance of this weekend is that you invited Mom and I here on this uh, 71st anniversary, and it actually is four years ago today that Dad had his heart attack, and Mom and Dad were in that car accident, and then dad died two days later. So he died uh, on the 15th of October. So this is kind of that weekend, you might say, that we um, think about dad and in his memory do quite a few things. And so on this particular weekend, uh, I, I want to do something that's uh, a little different, okay? And in his memory, I thought that I would try to look up one of his sermons that he preached here at Algonac and try to preach that sermon, okay? And uh, now, 
<laughs> uh, going through all of Dad's sermons was a real task. I mean, there, he, he keeps his sermons like I keep my sermons, in piles, okay? And so Mom had boxes of his sermons, and one of these days I was going to go through them, and I thought, okay, well, this is a good time to kind of go through his sermons and see what I could find, see if I could find some that he preached here at Algonac, uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Well, I found quite a few because um, I don't know that I sifted through 1,500 sermons after 40 years of ministry, but I did find one February 16th, 1964. Now, who was here February 16th, 1964, even if you were in the cradle? Yeah, okay, now look around, there's some of you. All right, now, I expect you to remember this sermon. All right? I expect you to, oh yeah, I remember Gene Beavers preaching that sermon February 16th, 1964. All right. And it was cold that day. And there was uh, ice out on the river and, you know, all that stuff. So just uh, imagine that for a moment. So it was a sermon about Christian assurance and about the most important relationship that we need to have, which is with Christ Jesus our Lord. And Dad thought it was important to preach that sermon February 16, 1964, because the Algonac Church needed to hear it. All right? That's kind of how preachers do, you know. We, we kind of... Uh, pray and think about what it is that the sheep need to hear, all right? And this is one, as I, you know, I'm pulling through a lot of sermons, and, and I'm thinking, okay, what, what can I do? And, and, and another thing about Dad's sermons, I can't read them. So, you know, if I, if I go down like this, it's because I need a little help, all right? But I have his sermon right here. This is it. February 16th, 1964, Algonac Church in the a.m. So I'm going to try to preach this. Or just hang on, okay? Let, let's see what happens here. Because like I said, he, he thought this was important for Algonac Church on that particular day. And I think there's something for us today, okay? So let's dive in. If you have your Bibles, uh, open to John 15, because I'm, I'm going to read a few uh, verses of Scripture here that I think are important. And, uh, uh, and then share some of the thoughts, like I said, that Dad has in this sermon. Now, as we begin, life is made up of relationships between one individual and with others. Husband and wife is an example, parents and children, family and relatives, uh, friendships and business re relations, and so on. But there's a relationship far greater, and that's the one between Christ and a Christian. And it's to be a close relationship, no doubt. Many Christians today do not experience this closeness to Christ. In fact, many have separated from this vital relationship. But as the members of the body of Christ, we must remain in this vital relationship and to maintain that relationship and to keep it strong because that's what God wants. So as we discuss this relationship, we were, we're going to see the necessity of this relationship and how to maintain it and the results of it. So let's turn to John chapter 15 and this is um, a key passage as Jesus is teaching his disciples and apostles what it's going to be like and how they need to maintain this relationship. Verse 1, follow with me as I read. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Jesus is speaking here. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And this is my command, love each other. A couple more verses. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. This was the passage of scripture that was read on that particular day. And as we look at this scripture, the scene must be kept in mind. You see, the Lord and his disciples had just eaten the Last Supper. They had risen to go when Jesus begins to tell this, this illustration. And on the table, there was probably uh, uh, the fruit of the vine in some way, and no doubt there were vineyards around them. And in the Old Testament, the vine is often used as the type or model of Israel, planted and tended by the Almighty as the farmer, as the husbandman. Israel, however, had proved a wild and fruitless vine, and instead of it, therefore, Christ had uh, now been planted by the Father as the true vine, the true vine. So Jesus says, I am the true vine. And he presents himself as that true vine to his disciples. Christians, then, are the branches to the vine. So there is this necessity in this relationship. Jesus points out that spiritual vitality or real life is in the incarnate Son of God, and, and human beings must be in this vital connection to fulfill this purpose of God. There, there, there's really two kinds of connections with Christ. There's a mere universal relation, which really bears no fruit, and then there's the genuine spiritual connection, which brings forth uh, fruit in this spiritual walk in life. So the necessity of this relationship is brought home to the apostles and, and Jesus' disciples as he speaks. And again, in verse 4, it says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can f bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You see, they were commanded to abide or remain or continue in the sphere of this example of Jesus in his life and in his doctrine. Their wills were to cooperate with his will in maintaining the vital flow of life from him to their lives. That's why the connection, that's why the remaining in him. True Christianity is a personal and mutual relationship of cooperation and the vine is the life. And in order to live and to bear fruit, the branch must abide in the vine. So Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. There needs to be that connection. 
uh, the spiritual relationship is necessary. If, in, if anyone does not remain in me, Jesus said, he is cast forth as a useless shoot branch and is withered away, and they gather them up and they burn them. And this really is that warning that he's giving to his disciples that they need to stay true and that they need to remain in him. So what a blessing it is for us to have this kind of relationship with our Lord, knowing that it's a life relationship. It's not a death relationship. And then as we filter through what Jesus says here in chapter 15, there's a few results that just jump out at us. The results of being connected and remaining in him. And the first result is the bearing of fruit. Again, if you would look at verse 5, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. That is the result of staying connected to Jesus Christ. The Lord has laid upon us the branches, the responsibility of giving the world the fruit of Christ's life. Every Christian is responsible to bear that fruit, and it will come as we're connected to him. And of course, Galatians chapter 5 lists those fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, gentleness. Those are the things that will come from a life that is connected to Jesus, that remains in him. And this is going to glorify the Father as we exhibit these fruits as well. And it keeps us in this relationship with Christ. So the first result that jumps out at us is that of bearing fruit. As we remain in Jesus, um, we will bear fruit. The second result that comes is found in verse 11, where he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Another result of remaining in Christ is joy. A life of joy. And the, and the first is that production of Christian joy in them that, that will be seen by everyone because it is as well one of the fruit that we were talking about. But Jesus wants Christians to have the kind of joy that he had because he said, my joy is complete. It's not half-hearted, but it's a completed joy. It's connected to the vine is what brings that joy. And the disciples' joy depended on their being fruitful and holding to the only true objective in life, which was to glorify God. That's what it was all about. We, we have joy because we realize our close relationship with Christ. That's a good relationship. It's one we know is important, and so as a result, it's good. It's favorable. It's something that we enjoy. We have joy because we know we're doing what Christ wants us to do. We're doing our mission as his servant. Knowing that we're connected to Christ brings joy and contentment, knowing that I'm fulfilling what God wants me to do. And we have joy because we know our work is not useless. We know that what we're doing for Christ is the best thing and the most rewarding. And just a little side note from me, as I just jump out of this sermon a little bit, I think about Dad. And in his memory, I think of the attitude he had about ministry. You know, he, he looked at everyone as he loved everybody. And his contentment in ministry. Now, I know he struggled with a lot of things when it, come, when it came to ministry and church growth and things of that nature. But for 40-some years, he was faithful. Right up to the Sunday that he died, he was faithful to preaching the Word of God. And he found contentment knowing that he was connected to Jesus and he was doing what Jesus wanted him to do. Jumping back in. There is that warning still that the unfruitful will not have this kind of joy. Now, if you're wondering why things aren't going the way they need to be going, it's probably because of your connection 
to Jesus. Joy is the reward of complete obedience to the Father and remaining in Him. And then there's a third result here, and it's found in verse 14. Verse 14, it says, You are my friends if you do what I command. Now that's a pretty good statement, isn't it? For Jesus to say, you're my friends. I want him to say to me that I'm his friend. And the relation which exists between, the relationship that exists between Christ and his disciples was one of love and friendship. And the proof of this friendship for him would be our continued obedience. So as we're obedient to him, we continue that friend relationship because it, it really comes out down to if you do what I command. That's really important. It's not just, well, I feel like you're my friend, but I'm your friend because I'm doing what I need to be doing. I'm being obedient. So as his friends, we should be faithful and always loyal to him. As our rightful Lord, he needs our respect and our obedience. And this is the highest honor to be called a friend of Christ. And we remain in this relationship with Christ through love and through obedience, and we should always be called the friends of Christ. For this friendship to be maintained, though, we must keep on bearing the fruit for Jesus Christ. So those are the results. And then... Um, Jesus kind of gives them a little bit of encouragement as, we, as he finishes out this particular chapter and, 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 and segment, talking about how the world's going to respond to those who are connected and remaining in Jesus. You know, I think there's something that will happen there. There's either going to be that positive where the world will respond in a positive way, or as Jesus said, the world will probably hate you. Jesus told his disciples that they would be hated by the world and would need all the more to go with loving one another. Hatred's hard to bear, and the desire to escape it is one of the principal causes for unfaithfulness and fruitlessness. You see, Jesus was preparing his disciples to endure the wrongs that others placed upon them. They, they would be outlawed. They would be uh, religiously and socially outcasts. And the character of Christ and his work is contrary to the darkness and evil of the world. It's always going to be. It's always going to be. Don't think it's going to get any better. This is why the world hated Christ and his followers. You see, Christ came to reveal the Father, but his revelation only served to arouse the hatred against him that took him to the cross. So his teachings had this effect on many evil men. And Dad finishes and he says, Today, because of our union with Christ, there will be those who will dislike us and will do the things to try to hinder us. But because of opposition, we are not to be fruitless and unfaithful. But we are to remain in our relationship with Christ and to continue as his witnesses for Jesus. Now as I think about Dad's encouragement in this sermon. Uh, I think of three things, just real quick. As I bring all of this together, because that was what he said on February 16th, 1964. Here's three things that I would encourage you as you as a church continue on in your ministry beyond 71 years. First of all, stay connected to Christ through his word and make it a priority in your life. There's no other way. Um, as I was looking through dad's sermons, um, there was one theme that just kept coming out in all of his sermons, and that was stay true to the word of God. 
be in the Word of God, study the Word of God, read the Word of God. He had so many sermons about the Bible and how important it is for all of us as Christian people to remain. You know, how do I remain in Christ? I remain in Christ through His Word because He is the Word. The second encouragement I would give you as I've gone through Dad's sermons and especially this one is stay connected to one another. I know Dad many times would preach sermons about encouraging one another in the Lord. And he was all about unity. He was all about loving one another and being, being a part of the church and being connected to each other. Not only connected to Jesus in this vertical way, but connected to one another in the horizontal way. And when we stay connected to one another, we will accomplish God's will on this earth together. We can't do it apart. We need each other. The third encouragement is to live your life connected to Christ in such a way that people will witness the love of Jesus and glorify the Father in heaven. You know, the question is, how do I bring people to Jesus? Live your life of Jesus to them. And I've always taught that evangelism is building a bridge from my heart to their heart so that Jesus can walk over. That's what evangelism is. You know, it's not cramming the Bible down somebody's throat, but it's living the life. That's what brings people to Jesus. It's living the life so that Jesus is going to walk over this bridge, but you've got to build this bridge so that they, you earn the right to be heard and that they hear you and they see your message in your life. And yes, you will eventually have to say something. You know, if I'm going to build this bridge to them, that's the relationship. But when Jesus walks over, he'll change their lives. He'll make something different happen. So live your life connected to Christ in such a way that they see your witness and they glorify God in heaven. Well, I don't know about you, but I had a good time doing that. <laughs> kind of a special time. And um, if Dad were here preaching to you today, he would tell you to stay faithful. Amen. Remain faithful in Jesus. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for this day and uh, for the opportunity we have to open your word. A word that is lasting and eternal, doesn't matter when it was preached. But today it has a special meaning. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the message of remaining faithful to you. And may we do that. And as we close out this service, may we uh, all uh, take every effort uh, to remain faithful in Christ and to make decisions that will please you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.